stop motion, you've got a nice season different here that they're running. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure being here and hearing all these um, interesting talks. As was said, unfortunately, I will use last as a moment to didn't read my, but I hope I can spark your interest anyway. Um, so yeah, the title of my talk is Does the Mouse See Differently When It's Running? And when I thought of this title, I was mainly thinking of how does visual processing change when the mouse or when we are running? And fortunately, I don't have to convince you that this is an important question because the whole visual input changes when you're running and you still, your brain still has to make sense of this. Also, we heard um, your goals may be changing when you're navigating. So it would make sense to maybe adjust your processing with this. Also, actually perception is changing when you're locomoting. Also this morning, I learned maybe I should not call it perception, but um, action vision. Um, but yeah, so we know from human studies that optic flow is perceived slower when you're walking, but also your discrimination between optic flow speeds is improving when you're walking. Um, so the question I want to ask today is where in the brain does this visual input and behavioral information specifically about locomotion integrate? And the point I want to make is that it's happening very early, maybe earlier than it's usually appreciated. So the focus I have in my lab is this area called the superior thickness or optic tectome in non-mammalian um, species. And here's just a little overview. Um, here's the superior thickness. It's one of two areas that receives image forming information from the retina directly. In the mouse, it's actually seems to be very important because it gets input from more than 90% of the retinal ganglion cells from the mouse, whereas LGN in the thalamus receives about 25 to 50%, which is very different from the primate. But so in the mouse, it seems to be really a, an important visual hub in the brain. And the superior blip is also interesting because it doesn't just do vision, which is mostly happening in the superficial areas, the deeper layers then transform this visual information to control behavior, like innate behaviors like the rest when there's a threat or escape or approach movement or suit movement or just turning your body towards something interesting. Okay. So I think it's it's a nice area to study because whatever is happening in this visual area may actually have direct impact on the behavior of the animal. So how do we study that? Um, we use uh, calcium imaging, two photon imaging in superior thickness. Unfortunately, the compass is not great, but it's a bit tricky actually to get here, to put your window there, because at least half of the area is covered by cortex, which we do not want to touch. And the other half is uh, covered by big blood vessels. So the surgery is a bit tricky, but once you're there, you can uh, have nice optical access to the neurons. And we are imaging those very superficial layers where the retinal input is coming in and most of the visual processing is happening. And this is one uh, typical average image you uh, get when doing calcium to photon imaging. So here you see uh, use the green sensor GCAMP and you can see identify single neurons in this area. Um, when we do our imaging, we head fix the mice, we surround them with several monitors so they can see stuff. And when they're in the experiment, they're free to run whenever they want to. They're sitting on a treadmill or here a floating ball. And we're tracking their running and pupil size to get some information about what the mouse is doing. You can see down here that pupil size and running are highly correlated with each other. So I'm using both measures interchangeably to talk about active or inactive state. Um, yes, what I wanted to say is we analyze both things. And for most of the things I will show, I did analysis for both and the, the results are qualitatively very, very similar. Right, so here's one data set that we collected in the superior thickness. So here you have hundreds of neurons. Each row shows the activity. Uh, this is just during spontaneous activity. So the mouse is just seeing a great screen. 
and we measure pupil size with, with a video camera and the running speed of the mouse. And the neurons here are sorted by their correlation with running. And you can see quite clearly, I think, that a lot of neurons are positively correlated with running <laughs> and other neurons are negatively correlated. <clears throat> These are just two example neurons um, picked out, and you can see one is more positively, the other one negatively correlated. This is just the first principal component of the whole data, just showing again that um, most of the variation of the neural data is quite well correlated with the activity of the running of the mouse. Now, when we stimulate uh, the mouse visually with these grating stimuli, um, you still see the same pattern. So, in addition, now you you may be able to see some of the visual drives. So here you see how the when the stimuli are coming on and the neurons are reacting, but still you see this clear modulation of activity uh, with running. Now we looked at the uh, processing of the grating and especially the direction tuning, um, whether the pupil is large or small. And you can see here's three example neurons. So these are single traces to different orientations. You can see this neuron hardly responds when the pupil is small, but really increases its response to the, its preferred direction when the pupil is large. This neuron acts quite differently. So actually with large pupil size, so with an active aroused state, the activity goes down and you can see this in the direction tuning curve. This one is a funny neuron which is actually suppressed by the grating and is less suppressed during the arousal. So what we see is basically a game change of the tuning curve. What stays the same is the preferred orientation, so that's stable across the activity levels of the mouse. But this is how the deep, um, response to the preferred um, direction changes. So we see here in the black bars that about half of the neurons change the activity significantly. And again, of those half tend to increase their responses to the preferred direction part, decrease their responses. This is just the same data from the cumulative histogram. <clears throat> One interesting fact that I want to note <laughs> is when we differentiate between excitatory and inhibitory neurons, we see a bit of a difference. So the excitatory neurons here tend to increase their responses with arousal or running, whereas most of the, inhibit or the inhibitory neurons tend to decrease their activity. Unfortunately, in the superior clinicians, we don't have a nice circuit diagram yet, yet, like people have in the cortex. So we don't know yet what the relationship is between these populations of neurons, but it may be an interesting fact to figure out what's actually going on. So this was work I've done in my postdoc. So I've seen, okay, responses change, games are changing. When coming to Sussex two years ago, one of the goals of the lab was to expand the, the range of visual stimuli to see what is happening when we show the most different things. And one um, thing we did uh, with uh, Maria, the PhD student is in Mia at a postdoc in the lab, is to still show rating stimuli, but now change different um, frequent or different attributes of those ratings, in this case, temporal frequency. And I should say this is early, early days, early data. Um, but I thought I'd show you um, uh, this data set because I think it's really interesting, but take it with a uh, salt of grain, we still need to do a few controls, but I think it's already going in the right direction and I'm quite excited about it. So here you see uh, raw responses from four different neurons to these different temporal frequencies, either when the mass is quiet in gray or when it's active in red. So in this neuron, you see nothing is changing much, whether the animal is active or not, whereas in this neuron um, activity seems to go up when it's active most of the time. In this neuron, it's different. Responses go down and um, with the arousal. Um, and in the fourth neuron, it's different again. So a bit similar to what we've seen before, but the exciting thing is if you look at the uh, tuning curve for temporal frequency, it seems a 
that no matter whether um, the activity goes up or down, but actually the preferred temporal frequency is increased with running or last, right? So there was, uh, the neurons like to respond more to fast stuff when the mouse is running, which may make sense because it's seeing a lot of fast stuff. So here's just uh, the population result where we, again, as before, characterize how much the response is changing for the preferred um, frequency in this case. And here you see how this temporal frequency, the preferred temporal frequency is changing with running. And so far, no, it's in our analysis, it's just picking the, um, the grading that elicited most of the response we see that in many neurons, the preferred temporal frequency goes up. Yeah. In a second project, again, early results, um, this is by Florencia, um, also in the lab, we are looking at temporal dynamics of neurons in the superior plectus, here using electrophysiology. And again, we show these simple gratings, here changing in orientation, but we have a closer look at how the response changes over time. And here I'm just uh, showing two examples which maybe point into an interesting direction. So these, both of these neurons are again in the very superficial layers. And here you can see when the mouse is running that the initial response is quite large. So these different colors uh, correspond to different directions of the grating that we are showing. They're very large and then become very quickly quite small. Whereas when the mouse is in, inactive or quiet, the initial response is already much smaller, but doesn't go that far down as in the active case. So what we call adaptation seems to be faster or, or stronger in the active case. And there is another example neuron um, with quite low activity in the active case, but much stronger activity in the uh, quiet case. And actually you see another interesting phenomenon called sensitization. So it gets, the response is getting stronger with time. I have not really thought about uh, why that is the case, what the purpose is of this, but I think it, it's these things we need to look at to really understand what's going on to make sense of this modulation, which is happening so early on. Here's just some population data. Uh, Burns and out the distinguished data in the superficial layers, which are which get the direct input from the retina are very visual, the deeper layers, which are more multi-sensory and even motor related. And she plotted here the adaptation index uh, during the active and the quiet case. And it seems that adaptation seems, uh, gets stronger when the mouse is active and even more so in the deep layers. And that's just the histogram showing this by the data. <clears throat> so that's, that's all interesting. We still need to make sense of this, as I said. One question though, um, I try to answer during my postdoc is, where does this modulation come from? And one of the ideas was maybe from visual cortex because that's projecting back to the superior nucleus. And since many, many years, we've seen that activity in visual cortex is uh, influenced by locomotion. So what we did is again using electrophysiology and we recorded the data in the superior nucleus when we do nothing to the brain or when we inactivate V1. Okay, this is the neuron in the superior nucleus. Again, you see here in the control condition that the activity goes up when you're running. When you now inactivate V1, responses go down a lot because you take away this, this input uh, to this neuron at least uh, from V1, but this um, or influence by locomotion is still very visible. Okay? So we don't think that this uh, inference of yeah. bilocomotion is inherited from one. Here you see some population data. So again, we um, measured how much of its response is changing for the preferred direction. We can see again the diverse effects happening in the population of the clickers. 
but it's looking very similar no matter whether we are in a control condition or whether we are inactivating V1. So we think we exclude the V1. What else could it be? We thought maybe it's directly coming from the retina. Um, so to look at this, um, we express again the calcium indicator in the retinal ganglion cell, but instead of imaging the neurons in the retina, which could be tricky in a the way mouse which moves its eyes, we instead image the axon terminals in the secure platelets, okay, as you can see here. So we inject the, the virus GCAM into the eye of the mouse and then image in the secure platelets. Here you see some confocal images showing that we get a nice labeling of the um, axons in the very superficial layers of the secure platelets. Here we zoom in, and this is a now an um, average of the functional imaging of single um, retinal terminals. And this was a contribution from Leon's lab. So instead of expressing the GCAM in the whole cell and the, all the axons, we could localize it to the single um, endings for the synaptic uh, terminals and localize the activity there. And what we found looks very similar. So here we, we showed again ratings, and this is now a population of hundreds of photons. Um, we measure pupil and running, and we can see in addition to this very strong visual drive, you have this modulation by behavior. This was very surprising when we saw this. We actually planned this as a control experiment to say, okay, it can't be from the retina, but then we saw this and thought, oh, what, what is happening? And one of the first thoughts we have, well, maybe it's just an artifact, right? So if the pupil is changing its size, of course, there's more light coming in when it's large and less when it's small. So what we did is now putting the mouse in complete darkness, and the pupil is so large that we cannot measure changes. So we just measure running speed. But this is now the same population of food trolls sorted in the same way. And we still see this very strong modulation by one. So we do think there's something going on. <laughs> so locomotion is influencing the, the, the retinal output. Um, there's another um, control uh, we looked at to convince ourselves that this is probably not due to any light uh, input coming to the retina. And this is uh, what we did is we looked at different receptive field properties are off photons or on photons, so those that mostly uh, respond to black stimuli or to um, bright stimuli, and we didn't see a big difference. So we thought, okay, if the pupil is small, so maybe then the ones preferring dark stimuli should respond more, and the other way around with the on photons, but there was no significant difference between those. So it's another indication that it's not just simply driven by the input of light. <clears throat> and again, we looked at the tuning properties for orientation. So here's one example. You see that with arousal, the uh, responses go down. You see a nice tuning curve for direction. Um, and this is the population result. And you can see here that actually, surprisingly, most of the retinal ganglion cells actually decrease their response during arousal, okay, which is very different from cortex and also a bit different from what we saw in the pure clinical neurons. What that means, again, I don't know why you would want like less input or less visual drive in the retina when you're running. I don't know. <laughs> um, but that's, that's what we see. And we're actually not the only people who saw this. Uh, which is nice. So other people uh, in the Andaman lab, they did a very similar uh, experiment that instead of looking at retinal terminals in the superior platelets, they looked at retinal axons in the LGM, so the other um, area getting image forming input from the retina. And they saw a very similar thing, namely that during high arousal activity is mostly going down. They also saw another interesting thing, namely that 
there seems to be a difference uh, in tuning for uh, different spatial frequencies, namely that the suppression is much higher for low spatial frequencies than high spatial frequencies, and that there's some kind of gating mechanism, um, especially for, for yeah, lower spatial frequencies that can't get through during high arousal states. Okay, so again, we were very surprised. So we tried to, to get a step further and think of, you know, how is that possible? Where, where could this information about local motion come from? And we came up with two major uh, hypotheses or pathways. One is that neural modulators act directly on the retinal terminals, and they indeed have receptors, for example, for serotonin that modulate how much calcium actually get into those retinal terminals, which we would then pick up with the calcium imaging. And the other um, possibility is that these neuromodulators go directly to the eye, um, which is, I think, the more exciting <laughs> hypothesis. Um, and there are indeed a few uh, brain areas that do project back to the eye in mammals. Okay? So what we did to, to try and tackle that question is use again electrophysiology and put now our probe into the optic tract where we could measure from retinal axons and measure the activity there. And um, that's pretty tricky the experiment and doesn't yield a lot of data. So across lots of animals, I got like five axons, single axons. Um, <clears throat> and we went through a lot of trouble to make sure that this is actually retinal axons, but we convinced ourselves. And here again, we put the mouse into darkness. We recorded it's running and here the firing rate. So you see it's pretty much all over the place. <laughs> So it's not that clear, but when you look at the cross correlation between running and the firing rate, we see that in these two cases, that is a positive correlation. Okay, so somehow running increases the firing rate in these axons. And here's the population, so you see that quite a few of those axons have positive correlation, and uh, two of them have negative correlations. Um, so there is the possibility that locomotion and behavior already influences um, the activity in the retina itself. That doesn't, of course, exclude the possibility that it's also acting on the retinal terminals. Um, here's, here's just some data from a recent study showing that histamine, which is projecting back to the retina um, and is not locally produced in the eye, can change uh, the activity, the firing rate of different retinal ganglion cells when you show them different visual stimuli. So here, for example, increasing activity in their CPT activity. Right, so in summary, uh, I showed you that arousal modulates retinal output and neurons in secure thickness. It affects of locomotion include changes in response gain but also changes in hearing preferences, possibly, um, and changes in uh, temporal dynamics. And these effects differ across retinal terminals. So we saw upmodulation and downmodulation across the whole population. Um, one of the questions I would be, yeah, what I'm particularly interested in is trying to figure out what the purpose is or what the computational advantages of this behavioral modulation happening so early in the visual processing stream. And some ideas we have is in the direction of efficient coding so that you wanna hone into those features of the visual input that are actually important in the task or in the, in the behavior you're currently involved in. So maybe the, the past features, you wanna see them better when you're running. So what we are doing now is to look at different visual features like speed tuning or spatial frequency tuning and how they are affected across the population in the retinal axons and the neurons in secure click loss. And we're also looking for trying to look at different functional cell types to see whether you know, cells that have a certain task to analyze the, the scene, whether they are up or down modulated in the different behaviors. 
And at last, I would like to thank all the people involved in different studies. So this line of people was involved in the arousal story first paper. And these are um, members of my lab who um, collected the new exciting data. Thank you. So, I assume you've mouse the security interest is written top of your map. Yes. And so, do you see any regional information that's coming in? Do those peripheral vision, for example, drive your cells more than central vision or things you might expect like that? That is a good question. Um, so far, we only look at the peripheral vision because of this um, tricky bit I mentioned at the beginning that most of the superior collectors is covered by cortex. And we, so far, we didn't want to just get rid of cortex. So we are restricted to the area that is concerned with very peripheral vision. Yeah. yeah the other question was could you go back two slides? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But there's a five second uh, offset between those two time points. Uh, I'm not sure which one's leading, but that's a, that's a long uh, for a mouse, that's a huge amount of time. So, how do you interpret that? Um, so, I think this time cost is mostly driven by the slow time cost of the running when you do simple which cross one's correlation. Leading here? It's going to be the they're running, or is that the uh, side they're not doing? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a big difference. I'm yeah, if I, something's building up while the other is, is accumulating. I don't remember right now okay. which way, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't interpret too much into it because of this very slow time course of the running. I think if you, yeah. the same I think it would be now. better if, if we had more data to look at like running onsets okay. and just look at those. Yes. Um, so you, you showed that the, the so the game model mentioned the, um, uh, you know, the change of game model mentioned the uh, in the next one. And then in the new data, you have this uh, shift in uh, frequency to the uh, temporal frequency. Good. Do you think maybe that shift can come from the frequency or is the game or the regular or somewhere else? <laughs> uh, my guess is as good as you. There, there was a, there is a paper showing that the similar things are happening in primary visual projects. So there seems to be a shift in uh, the preference for temporal frequency. But again, whether whether it's inherited or not, yeah, I don't know. So, so my semantic is strictly not term. I don't know if people still think that's true. But um, <laughs> do circadian rhythms have a big effect on the visual system? <laughs> Maybe the next year. <laughs> 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 and my day ahead, what, what, what you're observing. It yeah. has an effect um, uh, on all that manner of sensitivity. Right. Yes. Uh, well, let's establish. Uh, uh, um, and then that's as far as you know. I mean, you know, beyond that, you know, the, the, the farther along the city, the more the other ways. I think what we definitely can say there's no shortage of things that will probably have an effect on the early visions. <laughs> I think, yeah, we're just starting out, but um, yeah. Thanks. 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 Thanks.